My name is Marina Basu. I'm a doctoral candidate at Learning, Literacies and Technologies program at uh, Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at ASU. I'm interested in art-based research methodologies, so my current research includes uh, using art-based research methods in mathematics teacher education. Before this, I've been a mathematics teacher, teacher educator, and curriculum developer. So I bring all of those interests into my current research. A lot of my work and teaching uh, involves active learning strategies. These are instructional strategies that scaffold um, both the teaching and learning of material with creativity. So the emphasis is not so much on the content or the matter, the emphasis on critical thinking and creative thinking. Uh, what happens when we use active learning strategies in the classroom is that we are, um, you know, teachers help students move away from being passive uh, consumers of knowledge, being passive learners to taking a very active, engaged and motivated role in their learning because what these strategies do is that it opens up the learning for exploration. The strategies help structure the learning while at the same time leaving these openings. So both teachers and students feel empowered to try different things, to engage in um, discovery learning, experiential learning, and really become active and creative in what they are doing in the classroom. Teachers also benefit from active learning strategies. Once they know how these strategies work and how they are structured, they can feel more confident in allowing room for exploration, for play, for trial and error, um, for making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. Often as teachers, what happens is we ourselves have come from very you know, traditional ways of learning and we don't always know how to think or teach differently, even if we want to. So these strategies are very helpful in that respect, in teaching with creativity, not just for creativity. The other thing about active learning or why is creativity not being used as much in the classrooms as it ought to be, is not because educators are not aware or don't want to use uh, creativity. What happens is there's a huge emphasis on accountability, standards, assessments, exam-oriented curriculum. And in that kind of an environment, it becomes very difficult to allow for exploration. Teachers are just trying to you know, keep up with the requirements. Sometimes they are not allowed to create their own curriculum. They have to follow the state mandated curriculum. The other thing that happens is because as teachers, we were taught a certain way, we often unconsciously bring those same habits into the classroom. And the third thing with creativity and education is that creativity inherently is a very ambiguous process. And these can, be, can become um, challenging and scary if we have to all the time focus on standards and meeting the standards. I was quite excited on knowing that I've won a graduate student paper award from AERA uh, for my SAGE handbook chapter on Krishnamurti's insights in education. I was drawing from my teaching experiences in a Krishnamurti school in India, and these are called case schools. There are, there are a handful of these schools all over the world. The schools follow the philosophy of Jiddu Krishnamurti, and the emphasis is on exploring what true education is, exploring the flowering of goodness, as Krishnamurti calls it, in students. To encourage that kind of pedagogical practice, we very deliberately, by design, do not have textbooks, do not have tests, do not have uniforms, especially in the elementary grades. So what instead happens is that teachers collectively design the curriculum. Most of it is very um, creative, very cross-disciplinary. A lot of learning happens from nature. Um, the schools are almost always um, situated in large acres of forested land. So the children are al allowed to go out and explore and draw from that learning and bring it back to the classroom. Teachers also have the freedom to explore and that's where I was really fortunate that I was teaching in a school like that. We are allowed to figure out different ways of teaching. We are allowed to integrate across curricular areas. We are allowed to deviate from that day's work if you know the children have a burning question or the weather is just gorgeous and we want to go for a walk. And all of those become the part of uh, very rich learning experiences. So in these schools, 
uh, we had no formal assessments in the elementary grades and even in the middle grades. Instead, we wrote narrative reports at the end of the year based on our observations of the child in the learning environment, her interactions with her peers, her inclinations, her aptitudes. And in order to do this, the teacher had to be particularly observant of the child. Observation in this sense has a very significant role to play um, in Krishnamurti's philosophy, as well as in the pedagogical practices of these schools. Students and teachers, both of us, um, we learn to observe, to listen, and to relate with the world around us, as well as observe what makes us think and act in certain ways. This deep observation is the foundation of all education in the Krishnamurti schools. What I was clarifying in this paper that got published was that such observation does not come from a place of judgment or comparison. You know, you're comparing one student to another as happens in rankings. You're not comparing the student to standards, which is another kind of comparison. Um, instead, it has to be grounded in a relationship between the teacher and the student, and that is fundamental. So often we are caught up with teaching content, teaching to the test, that we forget the child that we are teaching. And that's how most school systems are structured. So I was showing an alternative educational system that starts from entirely different premises. So this chapter has been published in the SAGE Handbook of Global um, Childhoods. It helps increase the visibility of my work and the primary reason I wrote this piece was to create an opening for a dialogue between West and East, especially between the Western ep epistemologies or ways of knowing and Eastern philosophy that inspires alternative epistemologies and pedagogies. How this paper came about is also very interesting. Um, so there was a required seminar in um, the doctoral program here uh, called the Transdisciplinary Seminar. Dr. Begato and Dr. Serafini were my instructors at that point of time, and they had assigned us a task to interview a scholar um, from some part of the world. I go, got to know about this scholar from Auckland, New Zealand. I reached out to him, and our interview really turned into a conversation. He was very excited to know about the kind of school that I had taught at, and then he invited me to write a chapter for this. So I have both MLFTC and Dr. Teza from, from New Zealand to thank for this paper. And of course, I'm very grateful to all my students and my colleagues at the school. So in my role as a teacher educator, the one thing I want um, pre-service teachers to keep in mind, and even in-service teachers, is to know, first of all, that creativity can be nurtured in all students of whatever age and ability. And secondly, if we are focused on the standards, the standards are in some ways the, the lowest common denominator of learning. Whereas we need to be able to trust our students that they are actually capable of being challenged much more. They are eager to explore, to be finding things out on their own, to be making connections and creating stuff, whether in mathematics it's creative problem solving, whether in English you're actually writing poetry or a, or a short story. Children are able to do that and they love doing that. So the moment you bring in that aspect into the classroom, learning automatically happens. What drew me to the Learning Literacies and Technologies program here in ASU was firstly its interdisciplinary nature. I saw the emphasis on interdisciplinarity and that completely resonates with me. When I was a teacher, I would find it very difficult to stay within disciplinary boundaries. I was always making not only interdisciplinary, but also transdisciplinary connections, the kind of breaking boundaries. And in my current role as a doctoral researcher at ASU, I am actually bringing in very different disciplinary areas that are not often thought of together. For example, arts-based methods, embodied methods from um, the School of Dance and Performance, into mathematics teacher education. So that was one reason. The other being some of the faculty here are leading scholars in their field. You have the leading creativity research scholars, for example, Dr. Begato, Dr. Mishra. You have the leading scholars in qualitative methodologies, for example, Dr. Merka Koro, Dr. David Carlson. 
and so many others, each of them stalwarts in their own fields. And I have been extremely fortunate that I've been able to work uh, with most of these people on their projects, on conference papers together, and even on publications. MLFTC has been instrumental in encouraging me as a researcher and forwarding my career goals. Uh, being part of an R1 or Research 1 institution, the courses here focus a lot on research methodologies, which is very useful to um, incoming graduate students. MLFTC also has these um, unique advanced methodological courses, for example, arts-based research practice, which when I first joined the program, I was completely unaware about. And then when I discovered these courses and started taking these, I was more interested in qualitative method methodologies. And I found numerous courses, both basic and advanced within that. I found that these were methodologies that resonated with me and my epistemological framework coming from an Eastern perspective I was able to find these uh, resonances and bridge between the East and the West. The other thing I really appreciate about MLFTC is that the professors here encourage us to um, draw from our own cultural backgrounds and experiences and philosophies. So that has really helped me shape and gain confidence as a researcher who straddles both the East and the West, engages in constant dialogue, critical dialogue, using one framework to critique the another. And um, I hope that with all that learning, the research publications that I've done with professors here, the projects that I've been involved in, which are very interesting, very diverse, um, all of those will help me grow as a researcher in a future R1 university and also as a faculty member. Mm -hmm.